In these times of uncertainty, it's all the more important that we keep collaborating, informing and inspiring each other, so that we can be smarter and better tomorrow. Welcome to the Pakhuis de Zwijger livecast. Good afternoon or evening or morning, wherever you are. Uh, welcome from a very sunny Amsterdam. Welcome to the second edition of uh, Emerging Stories. Um, every week I will uh, invite different uh, guests, uh, photographers, filmmakers, writers, journalists, um, and you can join us on our livecast uh, if you log in via Zoom. You can go to the website of Pakhuis de Zwijger, which is dezwijger.nl. And uh, via the webinar, you can chat uh, with other viewers and you can ask your questions to one of the speakers. And please tell us what your questions are. So today, uh, I will have three guests. Um, with me on stage is uh, Linda Polman. Uh, she's a famous Dutch journalist and writer. Uh, we will speak a little bit about what you are doing and what books you have written. And via Zoom, uh, uh, I'm joined by uh, my NOR colleague and photographer, Tanya Habjuka from East Jerusalem and uh, from Accra in uh, Ghana. We have documentary photographer and writer, Nana Kofi. Welcome to you all. Um, so, Linda. Very welcome. I'm very happy you are here. Uh, Thank you. Normally you are traveling a lot, right? Yes. Uh, and what does your day look like nowadays? And um, I'm working on a calendar. <laughs> yeah, it's a calendar. Um, it's called the Good Mensch calendar. 365 days. I, I'm tr I, I have the ambition to reform the public debate in Holland about refugees and, uh, and asylum. I think extreme right, uh, political direction of extreme right has become far too big and far too loud. So I want to quiet them down with a very clever calendar, with uh, every day an argument or, or a statistic or a historical context or a good cartoon or a good joke. So every, every day I give people new ammunition to have the conversation about uh, refugees, asylum, afresh and, uh, and, and new. So who, who's contributing to the calendar? You. <laughs> <laughs> really? you, you. You gave us a beautiful photo. Um, and there's cartoonists and there's people like Adrian van Dis and Geert Mak, who are very fam famous Dutch writers. Uh, people like Lieve Joris, um, um, cabaret chase, um, uh, um, uh, TV presenters. So there's a wide, uh, wide selection of people who have made a contribution to the calendar. Right. So um, I think uh, quite a few people will know you from the books you have been written. I think uh, to name a few, The Crisis Caravan is uh, is well known, uh, translated as well, which is, I think, about how NGOs are operating or not the operating. The International Humanitarian Circus, yes. Okay. yes. And um, then there's... Uh, uh, we did nothing. Yeah, that's about uh, UN peacekeeping. Um, I went to uh, to live with UN blue blue helmets for many many months to study how a resolution made in New York ends up in Rwanda or in Haiti, and how UN blue helmets have to deal with those res hmm. resolutions. And I think you brought your latest book. Yes, it's called uh, it's called um, um, uh, Nobody Wants Them, Niemand Wil Ze Hebben. And that's a book about you, uh, the European refugee policy since 1938. That's when I start my story. In 1938 was the first international um, conference about, about what to do with refugees in Europe. Um, which countries were prepared to receive the German and the Austrian Jews that were being driven out of Germany and out of Austria. And they, were f they, they needed a place to stay. They needed a, 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 a country to welcome them. So this was the first conference about this problem. 
And the end of the conference, they, they gathered for about 12 days. At the end of the conference, the sad conclusion was that not, not even one country was prepared to open up the borders to, to allow those Jews come in. So you're so, basically drawing a parallel between yes, 1938, I mean, what happened to the, the Jews? The, the same arguments that, that you had then, uh, namely that uh, refugees are a danger to society, they are a danger to our norms and our values. They have a strange religion. Uh, if you allow one Jew to come, then, then they will all want to come. The same arguments that you heard then are still being heard today. So you can draw a direct line between 1938 and now. So that must have, that's uh, quite shocking, no? I mean, how, how did people respond? Uh, How did politicians respond? Politicians responded not. <laughs> okay. uh, there, there, there's been almost no reaction out of The Hague or out of Brussels. Um, I, I have the impression that they did read the book or some of them read the book, but they choose not to respond because the findings in this book are quite painful. So um, um, I, I, do, I do believe that politicians have, have, a few answers, have a few questions to answer and they prefer not to answer those questions. So, so far, uh, there have been many reactions from, uh, from churches and from, from um, um, uh, uh, organizations, refugee organizations, but the uh, politics has not responded yet. Hmm. Which brings us to, 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 to today. Uh, I think we are seeing some images from Lesbos. Yeah. Um, <coughs> where you, you've been there quite recently, right? Yeah. That was before the COVID crisis, I assume. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I was there um, uh, about uh, a year ago and I was on my way to Lesbos again in, uh, in January, February. And um, I, I stopped my, my, my trip there because first you had these riots going on on Lesbos. The, lo the local population was rioting against, uh, against the refugee camps. They are tired of the refugee camps. Their, their economy is being destroyed. Uh, the refugee camps are absolutely packed with people. There's more people coming all the time. So, so they want a solution to that problem. They feel that they, they are... Uh, they are the, the toilet of, of Europe, you know, every, all of Europe wants to keep them on Lesbos and on one or two other islands. And the people on Lesbos and, and on those two islands are totally tired of that problem and they demand um, a cooperation of the rest of Europe. So there, there were big riots in the streets of Lesbos at the time. And when those riots were almost over and I was ready to go there, Corona started. So do you know what what the situation is today, because I believe Greece is more or less under a lockdown as well. A total lockdown, which, yeah. Which yeah. includes obviously Lesbos. Yeah, but, yeah, uh, yeah. What's the name of the biggest refugee camp again? on uh, Moria. Lesbos? Moria. Mm. That, so that's under a lockdown as well? It is, yes. Uh, people are, are allowed to go to a supermarket, for example, uh, which is uh, about two or three ki kilometers walking from from the camp, and then they have to they have to report back into the camp. Um, so uh, there's the, almost all N NGOs left. There's hardly any help left. There's a few doctors left, uh, and they are very alarmed about what's happening there because uh, they have no facilities to deal with the corona crisis. Even before the corona crisis, the facilities were at the total zero point. Uh, there's the, the, I've never, I've, I've, I've visited many camps in Europe, refugees, of, or in Africa, uh, refugee camps, and I've visited refugee camps in Asia. And it's absolutely shocking the condition of the camps in, uh, in Greece. Um, it's filthy, it's, t it's packed. Um, um, uh, people are totally depressed, they have no place to wash. Uh, they, they stay in, in tiny little tents donated to them by, by local people, for example. But the, like, the, they, like they depend on, on, on volunteers, the, the, not on, the, not on the professional organizations, but on volunteers. So the situation is, has, has, al has always been very sad and quite dangerous there. Because we, we all talk about social distancing and, I mean, look how we s sit, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, how is that uh, over there? <coughs> to totally impossible. It's absolutely packed there. People are, 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 are packed into one small area 
and the rest of the people camp camp around that area. The, the, the fenced in right. area is where they live in, in tents and in the containers. Mm. And around that, this it's it's one big tent camp. And any COVID cases already? We are not sure um, because the, there's no testing being done, obviously. Um, there, there people people are getting sick, but they may be getting sick from the normal flu because there's a normal flu epidemic in Europe as well. And they might have other problems like maybe cholera, or like, like maybe may, maybe they brought malaria with them. So we don't know if there are any COVID cases. And I don't I don't think they will they will readily volunteer that information if COVID has, has started in those camps. Because is, is there any existing healthcare system well, I mean, at the moment? There's a tiny little uh, a tiny little clinic of uh, Médecins Sans Frontières in uh, in in Camp Moria. Uh, there, there's a few volunteer doctors working there, and the rest of the people should be able to to depend on the uh, on the Greek uh, health system, but that's overloaded even for for Greek people uh, because of the of the of the uh, economical crisis there. Yeah. So uh, it is uh, it is a very dangerous situation. And. Any journalists who are reporting from no, there? No, no, no. You you get the occasional report um, uh, seeping through in Greek newspapers, and that is and that is translated into into English uh, wire services, for example. But there's very very little news coming from those camps, and it's not only in Greece, or not only on the islands in Greece. There are also camps on the mainland of Greece. There's camps around the border with Turkey. There's also camps in the Balkan, um, uh, and we get no no or hard or hardly any news from those places. Hey, and then we obviously still have uh, uh, the people on the Turkish border. Yes, yes, yes. People who were sent out of Istanbul and other cities in Turkey they, were they, told they that were they... They were seduced to go there, yes. They were seduced because Erdogan, the, the prime minister of Turkey, said that he was opening up the borders and they could now go to Europe. So people smelt their chance to, to make it into Europe. So they were seduced to go to the borders and Greece, Greece did not let them in. Uh, they bomb bombarded them with tear gas and with water cannons, etc. So those people are still there. Well, not, not all of them, but a few, th few thousands of people are still there. And they, they built a camp uh, on, the, on the border in, in no man's land. That is no man's land, yeah. right? So there's no yeah. facilities, health facilities or... No, again, it's, it's volunteers and it's a little bit of, uh, of, uh, of water and... Uh, and uh, and uh, I'm sure people donated tents and uh, people are allowed to go to the nearest village to, to buy food for themselves. But they cook on wood fire and they wash in the, in the, in the nearby river. So it's uh, all, again, it's, a, it's a, now in COVID times, it's a very dangerous situation there. Because and it would be an absolute disaster, yeah. right? If and also they're being kept there in no man's land. Eh? They're not allowed to go back into Turkey right. and they're also not allowed to, to proceed into Greece. So mm -hmm. uh, those people are stuck there. Well, so the book is now, it's in Dutch, right? It's in Dutch and uh, this week an Italian translation, uh, translation was published. Um, uh, of course, nobody took notice because it, Italy is in lockdown also, but uh, the publishing house promised to, to make a little party for the book when the corona crisis is over. But the Italian edition is there. I'm sure there will be a, a, an English t t translation. Um, I'm also looking for a publisher in Germany. So the, the book will make its way around Europe. And it should. Be. It's, it's about European refugee policy. It's not, it's not about Holland. Holland plays a part in the book. But it is about how Europe has dealt with its refugees since 1938. Yeah, and this year is 75 years after the liberation in the Netherlands. Right? Yes, yes, and it's 83 years since since the first conference about uh, about refugees in uh, Europe. Yes. Mm. Well, it seems that people have time to read now. So. I I hope they do. <laughs> yes. Um, well, thank you very much for. Uh, for being here. Sure, yes. I'm really honored. And um, we'll go to my next guest, uh, who might have any remarks or questions to Linda. Uh, my next guest is uh, uh, Nana Kofi from uh, Accra, Ghana, West Africa. Welcome, welcome. 
Hi, Adieu. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to be on your network. Yeah. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. So I guess you you listen to uh, to uh, Linda's uh, Linda speaking. Any any yes, I uh, did. Yes. Any any remarks or uh, questions to Linda? Uh, I think that uh, Linda, your your work is is extremely important and and crucial uh, for for these times. Uh, people like me look at uh, the uh, the far right getting into power in Europe. Uh, look at Brexit and uh, and what is happening in the USA. And it's quite obvious uh, that uh, anti-immigration tendencies are on the rise. I mean, they've always been there. There's always. Uh, it's always been difficult uh, traveling the world as an African uh, and much, much more difficult if you have to settle anywhere else apart from Africa. And uh, I hope that uh, work, works like yours will help uh, change change the attitude we have towards uh, the, the, the maligned. And um, I have to also say that, uh, I mean, I'm happy that you, you start from, you do a comparison from the 1930s, but um, I think that uh, the root causes of this whole anti, uh, anti-immigration, anti-foreigner attitudes uh, go much, much, much deeper. And sometimes it helps to, to look at that, look at how we got here, you know, to look at how we got here. Uh, for example, you read Shakespeare's at the Merchant of Venice, and you see how the poor Jew <laughs> is treated, you know, uh, I think his name is Shylock. Yeah. And uh, somebody borrows money from him, and uh, he's he's totally, totally, totally uh, maligned and made to look like an extremely evil person, you know. So even in in literature, you can see. And once people like Shakespeare weren't corrected, these were what people read in school, and this becomes a dominant culture at some point. You know, and uh, I want to maybe hear you um, if you've ever looked at the correlation between culture or literature and the impact of that on on immigration. Hmm. Um, yeah, there's uh, one question, which is, uh, what does the Foundation Refugee do, is doing at the moment? Um, well, the, the, I'm sure oh. he's talking about the UN uh, High Commissioner for Refugees. I assume so. Yes. Uh, well, the, the problem with the UNHCR is that it's a totally powerless organization. It, it only does what member states of the United Nations tell it to do. So it hardly has any mandate and it hardly has any budget to deal with refugees who are already in Europe. So they, they, they do very little for the refugees and they leave them to volunteers. Um, and in Africa, it's, it's the same story. They build large refugee camps in countries that have deals with, uh, with European countries to stop refugees. So they build camps in those countries and they, they keep they help keep people in Africa itself. But you're, so, you're talking about today and you're talking about before the... Yes, oh, the, this, has, this has been going on for, okay. for decades already, yeah. Because the, the policy of Europe has always been to keep your refugees out of Europe, to keep them as much uh, 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 away from Europe as possible. So Africa is dotted with ref refugee camps uh, of people that Europe hopes, hopes will not go to Europe. So that is what the UN uh, Refugee Organization is doing. It is serving the European states. Who, the European states are the biggest donors. So it has to serve their donors. Um, so it's serving the, the European countries to exercise their European policy against refugees, right. against migration. Are we, we still have Nana here, right? Or we lost you for a second? Yes, I'm here, yes. Okay, yes. great. Um, so, so Nana, can you speak? Um, what's the situation in uh, in Ghana at the moment? Uh, so um, uh, we have over a thousand, uh, I think about thousand five hundred and fifty four confirmed cases of COVID. Uh, we've tested over sixty eight thousand. Uh, we've had nine deaths so far. Uh, we had a three week uh, lockdown, but. Uh, I think the economic pressure on, on the major cities was, was too much for the government. So the lockdown has been lifted. 
Um, there's a lot of campaign on uh, people wearing masks, the need for people to wear masks and uh, practice uh, social distancing wherever they go. But as we speak, uh, the lockdown has been lifted. So, so you're, today you're free to move around to go to the shop, but restaurants are open? Uh, I think that, so basically everybody understands that the lockdown was lifted because of the economic pressure. But business owners uh, are slowly responding. So I think that uh, banks are open, um, some businesses are open, but not everybody has jumped on the on the wagon yet. So I think you, I think we have a small film, right? I think you did some. You're normally a photographer, writer, but you're doing some other yes. work during this crisis as well. Maybe we can have yes. a look at it. Many are not Ghana for them. Or from the Nakku Fia, Kwa Mia Ghana in Yumapa, or many of Mana and Yamisha Hemp. So what are what are you doing here? For Miss Amsi, a general. So basically, I noticed that a lot of the campaign uh, to draw awareness on the need to practice social distancing, to wash hands for up to twenty seconds or more with soap and water, and uh, all of those were being done in English and on social media, and um, I felt that it wasn't translating to the local people. The people who needed information the most don't necessarily speak English. So fortunately, I speak a, a couple of local languages very well. So I decided to, to film myself doing uh, education, uh, raising awareness in the local languages. But the, the government would have had that idea as well, no? Or Yes, I mean, the government is, um, is doing a lot, I have to say, uh, but... Um, Influencers uh, in, in the country have also come together. So we have a platform called uh, Stop COVID-19 GH, and uh, all of us are chipping in. Everybody is doing the best uh, they can to, to make sure that uh, uh, there is very high awareness. So d during the lockdown, were you able to, to go out to work as a photographer? What was the situation like? No, I didn't go out to work. I mean... <laughs> It didn't become critical that I had to work, uh, so so I didn't. Uh, I managed to get uh, some PPEs. I got some masks and gloves and uh, disposable overalls, just in case I had to to go out. But pretty much the photos you'd get were people wearing masks, you know, health workers wearing <laughs> masks. And I, I didn't have any story, any particular story I found compelling enough to to risk my life going out for. So so I stayed at home. So, is it? Would would you say that it's under control? How how do you view the situation in in Ghana compared to Europe or other parts of the world? I mean, I'm not a scientist, but if you look at when we reported our first 100 cases, and you look at the numbers now, and Ghana is testing quite vigorously. I mean, we've done over 68,000 so far. So, if you look at it, so far we've lost only nine people. Uh, the, the climate has been extremely hot uh, in the past few months. And I'm not a scientist, but if you look at the nature of the virus, I think uh, the climate has been quite helpful in mitigating against the spread. Uh, but also the other fact is that Africa generally is a, is a younger population than Europe and, and, and Asia. And considering that COVID is more uh, fatal, uh, futile, more fatal in, in older older people. All these could be factors in the reason why the, the death toll in Africa has been uh, has been less. Would you because how is it in the neighboring countries? In uh, do you know in Liberia or yeah. Sierra Leone or or um, I mean because Nigeria? of poor testing, because of, of poor testing, generally you don't have a lot of recorded cases. But I know Nigeria has about less than a, th a little less than a thousand cases, but they've reported 25 deaths in relation to uh, COVID. Uh, they are not testing as vigorously as, uh, as Ghana is doing, uh, but generally across the death toll has been, has been quite low. But, but like Lagos, Nigeria has been, is still under a full lockdown more, more or less, right? Yes. It's not just Lagos. So I think Lagos, Ogun, and then, uh, there's a third state, uh, Abuja, uh, are all under lockdown. Because I, I heard a report that, that 
that gangs were operating in Lagos now and that they were going door to door to to rob people actually from yes, food or, um, did you hear about yeah. this yes i mean lagos for a long time had all these bank problems until uh, maybe the past seven seven years when they got a, a mayor who could really properly clean up the, the city so uh, it's it's not surprising also you need to understand that the majority of people in africa live day to day you know they have to go out and hustle to find their daily bread you know for for most people here daily bread is actually that literal there is no monthly salary uh, there is no support from government so if you lock people indoors for a couple of days the next meal becomes a challenge and and i think this is part of the reason why ghana decided to lift the lockdown because we have, for example, we have a, a cerebral spinal meningitis, CSM, which so far has killed about 50 people uh, in, 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 in the northern part of Ghana. If we, we are not locking down for CSM, why are we locking down for something with a, a mortality rate of less than 2%? You know? So if you look at the economics, um, you, know, you have to choose between the lesser of two evils. And, the, the crime rise in, in Lagos is understandable and expected, I think. And do, so you you agree with the with the policy of the Ghanaian government to to lift the lockdown, or you do you believe it's risky? I mean, it is definitely risky. But what are the options? You know, this is a country where. Uh, the majority of our business people, I mean, work in the informal sector. You know, so there is no government support. You know, uh, I'm a photographer. Uh, I know that artists in other countries are receiving subsidies from government. There is zero subsidy, zero support for us. And um, social distancing is impractical anyway. Most people just cannot afford to social distance. We live, we live in you know these community clusters that are packed. You know, and. It's, it's, it's really not practical. We have to find an authentic African solution to COVID if we really want to address it. Social distancing sounds great. It's just not practical. A lot of people don't have running water. So wash your hands with soap and water for 20 seconds sounds great. But it's not practical. Not practical, not possible. You try, I mean, but it's not... I mean, I can do it, but then... Uh, I'm not the, the the typical, you know, which is which is the reality. So, uh, yeah, it's not practical. So, what 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 is the African solution to COVID? You believe? I, I don't. I don't think I have an answer to that. I, I I feel that it's something we weren't prepared for and met us. Uh, it's, it's, it's just a disaster. I mean, Africa Africa has been everybody's uh, uh, breadbasket apart from Africa. Everybody happily loots uh, from Africa. And Africa has been deliberately impoverished because our poverty benefits others. You know, And so when you find yourself in a situation like this, listen, New York has more Ghanaian doctors than Ghana. <laughs> you find more Ghanaian doctors in New York, just New York than you find in Ghana, because it's easier, it's more profitable, it's more convenient to be a doctor in New York. And most of them were trained in Ghana. So, you know, with all our best resources constantly borrowed by others and all that, um, yeah, I, I don't think Africa has an immediate uh, solution to COVID now. And, and I have one, one more question, because I saw a Facebook post of yours uh, quite recently. Maybe we can, yeah. Ah, Dear one. white journalist, can you photograph Africa with the same level of respect and empathy? Dignity is a fundamental human right, not the privilege of a few. Signed by you. <laughs> can you speak to this a bit? Yes, I mean, first I'd have to say that my condolences uh, and uh, to everybody who has lost a loved one uh, uh, to COVID. It's, it's, it's always a very painful thing to, to lose somebody you love. So you have my condolences. And uh, 
this uh, I know that this post to some maybe came across as insensitive, but the objective was, you know, it, it was just out of shock because um, if, in fact, if you just Google Ebola and Google COVID and you look at the images that come up, you can see the visual disparity, you know, and uh, when I was shocked when I discovered that about 3,000 people had died in Italy as at that time. Because what I was seeing on the internet were people singing sopranos from their, and playing violins from their windows and neighbors clapping. These were the videos that had gone viral. And I noticed that there was very little visual evidence of the catastrophe uh, that, that, uh, that COVID-19 was unleashing on Italy. You know? So, so I, yeah. So you, you're talking about that faces were blurred or that you were not seeing uh, images from uh, no, there were just no images. I mean, as, at, as, as at that time, there were just no images. There were, yeah, doctors in masks. So that, so that was it. Health workers in masks. That was it. Yeah. So what do you think is happening here? I think it's uh, there's a lot of censorship, but also that people. Um, People treat their own dead with more respect because everybody wants to remember their loved ones in a mm. positive light. So the kind of critical approach Europeans would have towards photographers who photograph European dead with, with uh, you know, <laughs> with disrespect, it's not the same if they came to Africa and photographed the African dead that way. You know, but if you, should, if you really think, yeah. But should, when European photographers or American photographers, when they come to Africa, should the same apply to them, actually? The, should, should it be shown the way it's being shown in, in this crisis in Europe? I think that the not showing in Europe was actually to the extreme because then nobody could really tell how serious it was. I right. think that journalism exists for a reason. And if there's a, there is a pandemic and there is catastrophe, we have to show catastrophe. I just feel that you can show catastrophe without dehumanizing people, without stripping people of all dignity. And it's, it's almost like a dance. It's just finding that balance. And I feel that, um, as, as a as photojournalism for a long time has celebrated what, for lack of a better word, I'll call vulturism. You know, we, we celebrate all these photos and we never ask the critical questions. Is this the best photo you could make? If that was your father in that photo, is this how you'd want to remember them? Uh, is there a better way? You know, and so we, we aspire to become like, these photographers who basically just um, uh, photograph with utter disrespect for their subjects. So it is the extremes. It's, I, I'm advocating for finding a balance in the middle. There's no need policing journalists when there's a pandemic. Let them do the work, but they also need to have the sensitivity and empathy and respect for the subjects they photograph, no matter how uh, catastrophic the situation may be. Tanya Linda, any uh, any comments on? Uh... No, I I totally agree. It's not just with the Corona crisis that, but what you describe is happening. It's always happening. In the if there's death and destruction in Africa, we are shown that in in its full glory, you know, um, uh, and we never get that uh, when when there's something happening like that in Europe. So I I agree entirely. It's totally respectless, and it's also very sad. Um, if I may, uh, I saw when you posted that um, a couple of weeks ago and I shared it and it caused a, a bit of a rift and a debate uh, on my Facebook wall. And what was interesting was the majority of people that were reacting were people that I know ultimately would believe in what you were saying, but it was almost like a, a wounded sense of uh, attacking the profession. And when we debated and pushed a bit further, I, I think everyone came around. I think there's a lot of similarities of uh, Orientalism and othering 
that uh, imagery from across the Middle East and uh, across the continent of Africa share. I think that's something that we could understand. It's a very reductive approach to storytelling. And I suspect that some of the times people are sort of bewildered. Some of the, because there are fantastic, respectful journalists like Daniel Baharluk and people who have treated pandemics uh, in West Africa respectfully, humanely, if you will. But um, I think that sometimes journalists come and they're almost bewildered by the access that they stumble upon that they wouldn't easily do so in, in their home Western countries. And I think it's so different that they're, they're bedazzled or, uh, by the, and it's so easy to other. And I think you're absolutely right. It was a very apt point that you made. And I, I had to question some of the own imagery that I made in Uganda, you know, a woman who had been walking from uh, uh, and stumbled into a clinic and her water broke just as she walked into the clinic. She'd been hiding from the LRA for days. And I photographed all of this front line, no questions asked, but I had really, I, I took those images off of my website years ago. I had to question, would I have done the same in my own country? Would I have been allowed to? And so I thought it was excellent questions that you raised. I hope because, people get over their hurts and, and start to question more. Because Tanya, Tanya Habchuka is my, my next guest, actually. She lives in East Jerusalem. So you share, actually, the comment of, of Nana. I mean, you work a lot in Palestine um, or in the Middle East. But I, do you have the same observations? Uh, absolutely. I mean, I, when, when he wrote what he wrote, it distinctly uh, affected me because I'm, mean, especially Palestinians across the Middle East, uh, the Orientalism, the reductive imagery of women, how refugees are treated in the majority of the times is quite sensationalist. Um, lack of names, lack of nuance. Uh, Palestinians are either victims or uh, terrorists. It's it's constantly reduced. And, and while this is changing in the last couple of years, local, like the local voice, oh, that's a local journalist, it was almost um, derogatory. And there wasn't as much space for people to push back. I mean, it was it was amazing to me that it's a that it's questioned, that somebody would question a local voice more and assume, oh, he has, he or she has too much to lose. Uh, let's send in this foreigner. And again, there are fantastic journalists, photojournalists that I res respect immensely, but that is not always the case. Well, currently you probably won't see any foreign journalists, right? Uh, you're under a lockdown as well. You're in East Jerusalem. What, what's, uh, what's going on? Yeah, it's a, it's a very different situation. Uh, like Nana, I also had to question what my role would be as a journalist in this time. And um, there's been some phenomenal work, Shira Rubin Cohen in, in, in the New York Times in Italy. I myself didn't have any assignments. I myself would have been driving around my car. I could have accessed as a, as a journalist with a press Past, but did we need more images of people walking with masks on? There would have been the critical stories I would have wanted to access, I would not have been able to. So it was interesting because our DNA as photographers, as, as journalists, is to get out and document. And it's certainly dangerous uh, not to be, and it, and it hurts me. Uh, but I also had to question, was it ethical for me? I had to reassess if I don't have a particular story to access and tell right now in the traditional format, should I put myself, my family, whoever I encounter at risk? No. So I really had to, uh, to go and fight against my DNA and stay at home. I've been at home quarantined with my children since uh, March 4th. But the uh, are you restricted in your movement if if you if you want to move as a as as a photographer in your profession could you do so could you go to Nablus or Ramallah or the what what's what would be your what's the openness what's the restrictions I mean, again, uh, like most things here, it's disparate realities and strange liminal gray pockets in between. So you'd have to ask the question, am I operating in Israel? Or am I operating under the occupied West Bank, Gaza? And there's a lot of gray areas where people don't know, for example, if a journalist 
working uh, inside 48 uh, Israel, if they would be able to enter the West Bank and get back. So there's a lot of questions that people don't know. Again, I chose not to. I didn't have, I wasn't given an assignment. The stories that I pitched, I didn't have access to. But uh, I could theoretically have moved around, for example, across the West Bank as a journalist. Um, but I, again, did not, I chose not to. I didn't have a story uh, that was worth risking. We're seeing some images. They, they are from a colleague of yours, right? Where, where are they from? Uh, we're looking at images of uh, the amazing, Palestine, very young Palestinian uh, photographer, photojournalist in Gaza, uh, Samra Abu Alouf. Uh, she has been working in hospitals. She's been documenting the uh, the demise of the uh, Palestinian uh, healthcare system in Gaza for years. So this and is in Gaza. Her images. Right? This is in Gaza. Yeah, okay. these are her images. And what's interesting about Gaza right now is luckily the numbers have been low for the uh, COVID virus. However, it's an utter catastrophe if, because it's such a dense population. And again, the uh, healthcare system has been uh, just, just completely relegated and low. There's no drinking water, etc. So for example, right now, the uh, most vulnerable would be because they don't have the healthcare system to take care of their own population. So for example, uh, as it stands now in this time, um, cancer patients that are coming out of Gaza and getting treatment in Jerusalem are at great risk in transit for exposure. And also when they return home, they have to be quarantined. And so that's, that's a big issue. Because just for our understanding, because it, it's always complicated, right? So Gaza is controlled by Hamas, basically. So they, they I mean, are... you could argue it's controlled by Hamas in the immediate, but then it's also under blockade and they have no air, sea or land access or exit. So it's under blockade by the Israel. It's, a, it's almost like a, a virtual occupation, if you will. But it's, it's very real. Yeah. Drones are very real, etc. But the immediate mass. Yeah. And in East Jerusalem, are you under Israeli uh, jurisdiction or is this the Palestinian Authority? So East Jerusalem is occupied since uh, uh, under international law since 1967. And this has actually been a, a, a real issue uh, in terms of how to deal with the COVID crisis. Because you can talk about, again, I, we can go into a minute and how the Palestinian Authority has uh, dealt with this versus the Israeli government. But East Jerusalem, the Palestinian Authority does not have, unfortunately, access to. So there has been great holes in East Jerusalem Palestinian neighborhoods as well as uh, uh, beyond the wall. Uh, so, for example, Shofat refugee camp or Kufar Akab is tech, it, it's literally beyond the wall. And while they pay Israeli taxes, even pre-COVID crisis, but they don't access Tanya, if, if you speak about the wall, you're talking about the separation wall, right? Which exactly. Was, which was exactly. built by Israel to, to lock off the West Bank. East Jerusalem. Precisely. So, so this community uh, has not accessed, had not ha act access services until very recently. And the interventions the community tried to make, for example, in Silwan, uh, a particularly traumatized population uh, by settlement activity, they had uh, doctors who had connections to the Palestinian Authority who set up a makeshift clinic for testing inside a mosque. And it was raided by Israeli forces uh, about a week ago uh, because uh, they didn't want to allow any Palestinian Authority presence, yet they had not at that time set anything up for the population there. So the, the reason the Israeli police raided it was because they didn't want the Palestinians to test? There, sh there should be... No, according to their laws and interventions, they believe there should be no Palestinian authority, no Palestinian political representation inside East Jerusalem. Okay. I think we you, ha you had some images of this, right? 
Oh, for- um, yeah. Yeah, right. these are just two images that I got from a very renowned uh, activist, uh, uh, Fakhri Abu Diab. And uh, this is, was inside the mosque. Uh, this was uh, Palestinian doctors who were doing testing. And in the second image, you'll see the uh, Israeli forces uh, that came and raided and took all of the equipment. Um, so these are from activists inside Silwan, these two images. And it's closed now. That's it. It's closed. So that's the negative. On the uh, on the good on the positive side, the uh, thanks to organizations like Adala, which is an amazing uh, uh, Israeli and Palestinian uh, NGO. They actually uh, petitioned and fought and opened a case in the Supreme Court. And now there are eight testing centers uh, inside uh, beyond the wall. Uh, as well as sort of, God, it sounds like the Game of Thrones, but this is the reality here. Beyond the wall, uh, we have uh, testing clinics now around eight around East Jerusalem. And, and but it's still a great disparity. And what's interesting is in Israeli media, um, the two populations that have been sort of demonized have been the Haredi, the Orthodox Jewish communities, as well as the Palestinian citizens of Israel. Uh, saying that they weren't in compliance with quarantine, they weren't in compliance. However, they were almost completely ignored. And so you're talking about two populations that are distrusting of the government, that have, uh, especially the Palestinians, an abusive relationship with the government, and they didn't initially release information, for example, in Arabic. In the Orthodox communities, they could have been interacting with the community leaders there uh, who the community would have listened to and shut down the synagogues earlier. So you have two very communal organizations somewhat distrusting of the government. And so there was really a delay of a response to these two uh, populations. And then a whole other can of worms with Palestinian laborers, uh, construction workers who were allowed initially as the quarantine was approaching to stay inside because they needed that cheap labor and they said they would live on site and that they would live and work on site and that they would be provided lodging and food. But the, the lodging was uh, refrigerators and factories. It was very sketchy lodging. And in fact, there's a very disturbing video that you can access that shows once uh, Palestinian construction workers, laborers began to get sick, they didn't want to deal with them. And there is a footage of a Palestinian laborer just literally being dumped on the ground at a Palestinian checkpoint and, and left for three hours yeah. before a ambulance could access him. The, Tanya, there's an interesting question from uh, Daniel, from the audience, uh, who's asking, do you think COVID-19 uh, will have a long-term effect on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? So it's, a, it's a great question. Uh, a lot of... I mean, uh, on the one hand, from the Palestinian Authority, I hope so, because this is the first time, I think, in maybe ever, that there has ever been a wide, popular, uh, positive response to how the Palestinian Authority has stepped up and governed. It's been largely positive. Um, but why they didn't do it before, we don't know. Let's, let's hope. But on the other hand, there's also um, business as usual. Um, 80% of settler activity, the violent attacks, one including an ax, there has been a, uh, a rise by 80% of settler activities in the West Bank since uh, January and February. Uh, de demolition of agriculture and trees as usual, and perhaps more worrying, this may be the only government worldwide that the, the lead actors enacting the uh, monitoring of the health crisis are the security forces, Mossad, Shin Bet, et cetera. And so there's been some, on the one hand, monitoring through phones of uh, people who may be infected and then alerts that come to anyone there around, but great uh, fear about what is going to happen with uh, those increased powers of surveillance after this is over. Yeah. Um, Linda, you had a question for her? Uh, well, th yeah, it was something you said a long, long time ago. Uh, you said that uh, that center for testing was closed, but other centers were opened beyond the wall. Uh, but uh, so, do people get access to those other centers to get tested, or or are people left with with nothing now? 
there was a hole where they were left with nothing. They were completely ignored beyond the wall as well as even inside the wall in the East Jerusalem neighborhoods. A lack of Arabic tele, um, telling them what to do to protect themselves. And like Nana mentioned, actually, social distancing being a privilege a majority in these areas didn't have. Uh, so they tried to do some of their own initiatives, uh, such as the Silwan Clinic, which was shut down since Adala took the case to the Supreme Court, there are now eight testing centers uh, in, in these communities. Yeah. Whether it's enough, uh, probably not, but it's, it's moving in the right direction, but at a delay. It's probably more than we have in Holland, to tell you the truth. There's very wow. little testing being done here, yes. Yeah. Nana? Yes, I'm here. Any... Uh response to East Jerusalem? Uh, I mean, any, the story always breaks my heart and uh, I'm really concerned about, uh, you just only hope that uh, COVID doesn't get out of hand there, you know, because it would just be a disaster. You know, it's, it's just heartbreaking. Tanya, I think you had, you had a small, very small video clip, right, of very recently uh, how times look like uh, during COVID. Um, oh, well, be before you I... show it, I'll just add, uh, this was an initiative between the Palestinian Authority and the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And so it was, uh, last weekend, it was Orthodox Christian Easter, and it was the Holy Fire where people believe in, uh, the, liar, uh, the, the fire lights spontaneously inside of the tomb and they pass it around the communities, cross checkpoints, they get onto planes and bring it across the Mediterranean. So this is a uh, home delivery of the holy fire because people were under quarantine and they had to order it delivered to their home. You, maybe you want to play the audio because the music they're playing is fantastic. <laughs> So th this is, uh, it's Ramallah, is it? Slumming the auto. <laughs> Looks dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> so this is in uh, Ramallah, Tanya? Yes. This, uh, this was in Ramallah? This was in Ramallah, and uh, it was organized where if the previous day by 5 p.m. you ordered the home delivery of the Holy Fire, uh, they brought it directly to your home. So how, how do the f next few weeks look uh, look for you? How did, what's your... <sighs> as, a, as a professional as well, right? I mean... As a professional, it's really been a, sort of an existential crisis and again, how to work. Normally, I would have been out front lines, etc. So as a professional, slowly I'm starting to get assignments again that I think are worth uh, the risk. The, the, it's, the risk has been mitigated um, and managed quite well for the Palestinian Authority. Um, they have their eyes set on the economy. So one of the measures they began last Friday was um, on Friday, because previously you could only be out to access pharmacies or uh, groceries. And as of last Friday, every Friday they, they shut down grocery stores and then open up other businesses. And they slowly, every Friday, they're going to open it up more and more. So last Friday it was uh, dry cleaners, home appliances. And of course, uh, Ramadan is coming up this Friday. So they are relaxing measures a little bit more, um, but keeping uh, mosques and, uh, shut down. So after 7.30, you're with your family taking your iftar and there's not the traditional... Uh, uh, familial activities. But are, are you worried how Ramadan will, uh, if people will, will observe the, the, all the restrictions? Uh, again, those who've had the privilege of social distancing, which have been um, Palestinians in the, in, in the majority of the cities and in the villages, uh, not so much. It's really been the Palestinians inside the refugee camps uh, that has been more problematic. And the, and the real fear, again, is these Palestinian laborers inside Israel. 
And it's still a, a loop, loophole. Like, do they access Israeli services that hasn't been clear? Where's the legality of sort of, sort of dumping them back? Most of the cases that have that have come inside Palestine, I believe we're at, uh, what is it, 329 in the West Bank, have come from Palestinians inside Israel. So that's a real fear that remains a question mark. But people have been really compliant with uh, the quarantine. And... At this point, uh, no, I'm, I'm not so worried personally. But again, I'm not an epi epidemiologist. Time is up, guys. <laughs> um, I really would like to, to thank my guests for, for Linda, obviously, for being live in the studio. I hope it was an outing for you today. It was, yes, it was. <laughs> and uh, Tanya in uh, East Jerusalem, uh, Nana in, uh, in Accra, I wish you all uh, the, all the best and uh, stay safe in the life. Good uh, luck. Thank you. Thank you, Kadi. Thank you for having us. Um, yeah, next week uh, we will have uh, another edition. It will be the 29th of uh, April. 4 p.m. again, uh, Amsterdam time, and uh, I'm very happy that my live guest next week will be Thomas Erdbrink, uh, well known because of the Our Man in Tehran series, former uh, New York Times bureau chief in uh, in Tehran, and he's just coming back from Tehran and will uh, will speak to us about the situation in Iran and in general. Then we will have uh, Marion van Rooyen, who is a Dutch correspondent in, uh, in Rio de Janeiro, who will talk about what's going on in Brazil and in, uh, uh, with the president, Bolsonaro. Uh, is he still hugging and shaking hands in uh, Brazil? Uh, and um, uh, my last guest will be Maxim uh, Aristavi uh, from Ukraine, and he will talk about uh, Eastern Ukraine, but also other uh, areas which are uh, separated, which are uh, where there's still a conflict going on and where there's no real functioning government and what's gonna going on there. Uh, on the 30th of April, by the way, as you might know, the World Press photo has just been announced. On the 30th of April, there will be an event uh, also here in Pakhuis de Zwijger. Uh, it will kick off at 3.30 uh, p.m. Amsterdam time, so tune in for that as well. Thank you very much and have a nice evening, morning, afternoon, and I hope to see you next week. Bye for now.